Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you kindly for your patience. We are ready to get started. My name is Alice Savorka. I am the Dean of the Faculty of Environmental Studies, and I welcome you to a highly anticipated session today with the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario, Dr. Diane Sachs. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging our presence on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Tuckeronto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, and the Métis. It's currently home to many Indigenous peoples. I'd also like to acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation. The area is subject to the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. I will also take this moment to acknowledge um, our organizers, Dr. Mark Winfield and Dr. Dana Scott, who um, have invited you all here so that we can hear from our esteemed guest, Dr. Diane Sachs. I am going to um, keep an introduction brief. Um, I will say that I had the pleasure of introducing Diane a couple of times last semester. Um, and Diane has been the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario for, uh, since 2015. And she has been a very diligent and effective watchdog for all uh, issues related to environmental um, regulation and, um, and governance here in Ontario uh, for the last few years. Uh, a lot has changed since um, um, we saw each other uh, a few months ago, and uh, we know that the province is in a bit of a moment of uh, reconsidering the role and importance of the environmental commissioner's role and position within the Ontario government. Um, Diane has a wonderful history of connection to York University, has been honored and awarded uh, numerous accolades from this community and beyond. I will spare, uh, I'll spare her the long introduction. Um, and uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Diane Sachs. All right, um, I hope you can hear, and I'm sorry for keeping everybody waiting. I was amusing myself in the subway. Uh, you've all had that experience before. And then eventually they said that we all had to get out and a new train was gonna come and then a new train didn't come. And, and then when I did actually get to the campus, nobody knows where Osgood is. And it's not on the map under O. So you just can't get here from there. So I, I am very sorry to be late. And we also don't have a clicker, so. Um, anyway, <laughs> so Mark, will you please go on? Anyway, let's let's try this. So um, I um, I was just going to talk. A I was asked to talk a bit about my role. So uh, mostly, what I want to talk to people about is climate, uh, and go, well, we don't really have time today. So next, please. Um, yes, yeah, next. So the Environmental Bill of Rights. Um, we are just about to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Environmental Bill of Rights in Ontario. It came into effect February 15, 1994. And it's a very special and unusual statute to give um, people of Ontario the right to participate in significant environmental decisions of uh, provincial government. Um, and it's based on these two key insights. The first is the government, that the environment is too important to be left entirely to the government. And uh, I have many, many, many reasons why people should not blindly trust the government on environment. Um, and secondly, that even within the government, environment is too important to be just the responsibility of a small side ministry, the Ministry of Environment, which has changed its name many times. So there's some process rights in the bill. Next, please. Um, so it's not that long ago, because I'm talking at a law school, I feel an obligation to talk about law, and um, it's really not that long ago in Ontario, it's, it's uh, not much, really just over 50 years, where basically everything we learned about administrative law didn't exist. And the, the law, when I was young, was pretty clear. Anything the Attorney General said was, by definition, the public interest and the government discretion, there was real, no effective way to challenge. So Ron, I should say, how many of you are law students? Okay, I hope, I hope you've heard of Ron Corelli versus Duplessis. Does this ring a bell at all? No, 
You know, why, why do you want to do people nodding? That's good. So um, this was a, a really vivid case of what, how much government, how much discretion should government have? So Duplessis was the premier of Quebec. Ron Corelli was a Jehovah's Witness who had a restaurant license. He, and he, he had a liquor license. So he was selling liquor in his restaurant and he was making money and he was using some of that money to bail Jehovah's Witnesses out of jail. Um, at the time, in the 1960s, Jehovah's Witnesses were considered to be um, fierce opponents of the Catholic Church in Quebec. And so Mr. Duplessis took away his liquor license so that he wouldn't be able to keep bailing the Jehovah's Witnesses out of jail. And Mr. Uh, Ron Corelli complained about this and went to court. And Mr. Duplessis said, I have the right to do this. This is a discretionary permit. I think what this man is doing is bad for the people of, of Quebec, and I'm going to stop it. So that went up to the Supreme Court of Canada, which did decide that Duplessis did not have the right to take away a liquor license in order to prevent one religious expression or another. But the fact that that what had to go all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada just wasn't clear. And then to make things even more fun, in 1964, the Ontario government proposed a wonderful new law that they could put anybody in jail for seven days, which they could renew any number of times they liked without charge and without judicial procedure until they talked about organized crime because there was a moral panic about the mob. And there was a revolt about this in the press and in the public that this was outrageous, that the government shouldn't. Well, I should ask, how many people here think the government should be able to keep them in jail indefinitely until they talk? OK, but it wasn't clearly illegal. They proposed a law to do it. They had a majority, right? Majority governments get to do pretty much anything they like unless there is some clear barrier. And so, um, next please. So that led to the McCrure inquiry into civil rights, which is we don't, not what we call civil rights anymore. But this whole idea, should there be limits to government power? Should there be some way in which that can be limited? Next please. So this, is, this was a revolution. This was an absolute revolution in administrative law that came from Mr. Justice McCrure, uh, Vinegar Jim, apparently he was called, and this idea that there should be limits, that there should be a right to notice, a right to respond, a right to appeal, any decision that affected your economic and legal rights. Next, please. And over the next generation, People got to be used to this idea that there should be some limits to government discretion, that we shouldn't just have to trust whatever the government tells us. Next, please. And, but by a generation later, by the late 1980s, the question was, should we trust government blindly on things that are not about economic rights? Should there be any limits on government discretion on other kinds of things? Are there other things that matter besides economic and legal rights? And the environment, of course, one of those things. Next, please. So we're all affected by these things. We all have a stake, but we don't have a direct legal interest in being able to breathe or being able to eat food that doesn't make us sick. And this was left entirely at the government discretion. Next, please. So, so this was the question, is blind trust enough? And we have had surely enough examples. Do we need more examples of why we shouldn't just blindly trust the government on the environment? Does anybody need more examples? We have lots of examples. Next, please. But then, then the question is, all right, if we can't, I mean, in a democracy, government is what we set up to make collective decisions. Well, who else do we want making collective decisions for all of us? Uh, the army? Uh, the companies? The church? I mean, who else is there to make decisions in the public interest? And so the idea was that having the public participate in some way would help with better government decisions, and particularly in these three things, information, because nobody knows everything, ideas, and legitimacy, social life. Next. So that was the idea. And the Environmental Bill of Rights was adopted with these participation tools with a lot of discomfort about, you know, can you trust the public? How much do you trust the public? Uh, they don't really know this stuff anyway. We've got all these experts. But here are the three tools that are in the EBR, and I don't really have time to talk about them. One of the, so in the front, uh, Dana's put out some of the pamphlets um, from our office, and there's one in, as an introduction to the Environmental Bill of Rights. 
I'd encourage you to pick them up. Um, if you don't need them, pass them on to somebody. They are also on our website. But I know it's easier. People absorb material differently if, if they at least see the highlights on paper. So next, please. So this is the kind of stuff that happens on the registry, even though the software is really horrible, which it is. There's about 1,000 hits a day on the registry. A lot of what is important. This government does not always obey the Environmental Bill of Rights, but they do quite a bit, at least post stuff. Maybe they don't listen to the answers any, as we've shown, but at least they do post some things. So there is a lot of information there. Uh, how many of you have used the Environmental Registry? OK, great. Thank you. Next, please, Mark. So um, lots of stats about applications. Applications are the tool for people to say to the government, you're, there's something you're not doing a good job on. Either there's a policy or a law that you need or you don't have, or you're failing to enforce the law, which happens more often than I would like. So there have been a lot of these investigation uh, applications, and a lot of them have raised really good points. And some of them have led to real action. Next, please. Um, there's also third party appeals, and this is a direct descendant of McCrewer. McCrewer has said that if your license, such as Mr. Ron Corelli's liquor license, is taken away by government discretion, everyone should have a right to one appeal. So that's an absolute fixture of administrative law. Now, the question that came up in the environmental rights is why is that just between the government and the polluter? What about everybody who breathes? And so there is a limited right of appeal in the Environmental Bill of Rights. Um, which requires leave from the Environmental Review Tribunal. Next, please. Right. So another part of the Environmental, so part of the Environmental Bill of Rights is about your right to comment. Part of the bill is about me and what I do. Next, please. So I'm a watchdog. Um, it's, I'm nonpartisan. I was appointed unanimously by the members of, all the members of Parliament in 2015 to report to them and through them to you on these three quiet little topics, energy, environment, and climate, and to be the guardian of the Environmental Bill of Rights. It's been part of my job to go around Ontario and teach people how to use their environmental rights and to encourage them to do so and help them understand. And, um, and to file these reports with the legislature to tell the, tr the, the truth without fear or favor because I hold to this old-fashioned and somewhat naive view that public policy ought to be made on the basis of facts. Okay? And I also hold to that now remarkably old-fashioned view that no one, everyone's entitled to their own opinion, no one's entitled to their own facts. So these are the kinds of things we've been doing. The, the role of commissioner was set up in the first place as a replacement for the US tool of citizen suits. In the US, if government doesn't obey or enforce environmental law, people can, can go to their lawyers and go to court, and very often citizen suits have been very effective in the United States in making government do things. But Ontario, we're a little more deferential than that. Nobody wanted to have citizen suits. Lawyers caused so much trouble anyway. And so the idea was that we'd have an environmental commissioner instead who doesn't actually have any power. Right? I don't, uh, but I can coax and cajole and encourage and persuade and embarrass and sometimes get things done. So that's what this is for. Uh, next, please. In addition to all the work I've been doing about environmental rights, the main part of my job, though it takes most of my time, is writing these reports on energy, environment, and climate, as well as special reports. We do have the summaries here. So these are the covers of the three most recent reports. Um, and I mean, I think I've been pretty even-handed in criticizing everybody, but um, uh, because no government is perfect and we always want them to do better. Uh, it is, however, quite clear that I am being particularly critical of the actions of the current government. Um, I don't think that being a conservative has to mean being an environmental vandal. But look at what's been happening in Ontario in the last six months. So in any event, um, that may be why I'm being eliminated. They don't. Uh, when, when a government takes action to silence a watchdog, generally there's a reason. There's something they don't want the watchdog to see, and there's something they don't want the watchdog to say. But they're not saying which ones. Anyway, next, please. Um, and we've also done these other special reports, technical reports. A uh, special report we did last year on, uh, on waste and recycling. We've also done uh, work on stormwater fees, on soil health. Uh, a number of other things. We've also got some information we're just putting on our, our website as fact sheets. Next, please. 
Um, and I, I should say for all of our reports, there is a webinar on the website. So if you want to learn more about climate change or about energy or the truth about electricity in Ontario, because most of what you hear in the public isn't true, um, we have a free webinar for those. So if you ever have time while you're folding the laundry or on the elliptical, please uh, watch, watch the webinars. Um, but yeah, that's what we've been trying to do. Next, please. And we've been working really hard to make the reports accessible. So uh, Dana, maybe you could hold up one of those summaries. So our reports are, are just bricks. But for that reason, we do these one-page foldouts with the highlights and pictures and big print. So uh, people who don't have much time, which is almost everybody, can get a general sense of what, what the topic is, what the bottom lines are, where to get more information. We've worked really hard on making our infographics support the, the message. We've worked hard also on translation. So we're required by law to have all of our reports available in English and French, but our EBR summary is also available in 15 languages, including three indigenous languages. Um, we do the webinars. People don't have to necessarily read. And so we've been working very hard on public outreach being more accessible, much more accessible than my office was before. I mean, the, the, the most recent energy report before I became commissioner, the executive summary was 11 pages of tombstone. If there were 100 people in the province who read it, I'd be surprised. So we have, we've been really successful in making this kind of information more accessible to people, more available, more appealing, easier to read, more relevant information. And that's made a big dif difference in people's awareness and information. Next, please. Um, we've also got some great stuff on our website. So uh, the arrow at the bottom, I mentioned before that the registry software has been really terrible. And one of the things that I, I coaxed out of the Ministry of Environment was a, a revision to the software. So you've probably noticed there's a beta now for policies, acts, and regulations, although not for instruments. I coaxed that out of the minister and deputy. It's still in beta. It's not complete. Um, it's a lot better than the old one. But it doesn't cover instruments at all. They may eventually get to it. So in the meantime, if you want to know, if you're interested in Blanding's turtles or development that might happen in a part of the province that you care about, or you're, you're interested in climate change or whatever, and you want to know when the government proposes something significant, well, you can either go search the, the website every day, or you can go to our website and put your email address and your keyword in there. We will send you a free notice whenever one of those things is posted for as long as our website allow, is allowed to continue, which I don't control. Or at least I won't control after the magic date, which we also don't know. Um, next, please. Um, so lots of public. These numbers are not really up to date because we haven't had time to update them. They're about a year and a half old. But we've got a, we've got a lot of attention. Next, please. Um, we also do a lot of things that are not so public to try to produce better environmental results in Ontario. And I'm very proud of the things we've been able to do. Um, some of them are absolutely for geeks. So the Municipal Asset Management Planning Regulation, I feel fairly certain that not many people in the province have bought, I mean, Alice probably has, but there probably are not a lot of people in the province who ne needed to read the Municipal Asset Management Planning Regulation. Is that fair? OK, good. Um, but it's important because it governs how billions of dollars are spent on infrastructure. And we have always had the rule in Ontario that councils have been required to choose what they fund and what they get senior government money for by keeping the capital cost to the lowest possible amount. And that has meant a very strong incentive to build cheap stuff that's expensive to operate and uses a lot of energy. Is that in our best interest? It really isn't. So. Uh, we worked very hard and we're very proud of the fact that that regulation now says that green infrastructure counts as infrastructure and that operating costs are part of that top line number that municipalities have to consider. So we, we work on a lot of obscure stuff, but it matters in terms of the kind of decisions that are made over time. Um, another one that, that I just mentioned up there is when we had cap and trade, some money was required by law to go into the greenhouse gas reduction account. Where it was required by law to be used to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in Ontario. And I have to say, since it was part of my responsibility to report on how that money was used, they used the money pretty well. But in 2016, the government was proposing to t take a billion dollars of that money to subsidize electricity rates, which I was satisfied was illegal 
and contrary to the best interests of the, of the province and would hamstring our work on, on climate. Um, and so I reported it was illegal and amazingly they didn't do it. So sometimes, sometimes it works. All right, next please. Um, we do a lot of, huge amount of stakeholder engagement as well. Um, sometimes they come to me, sometimes I go to them. Sometimes they're just looking for context and feedback. Uh, I was an environmental and energy lawyer for 40 years before I did this, so I've seen most things before from some point of view. So we've been able to help people sometimes find solutions, sometimes just understand issues in different ways, convening interesting meetings. Um, next, please. And, you know, being a strong environmental voice. And this is the biggest thing that's going to be lost. I, 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 you probably know. Uh, that in the part of the fall economic statement, the Schedule 15, which will be proclaimed or coming to force sometime between now and May 1st, but they won't tell me when, that uh, eliminates my office. So this has been a really important voice in Ontario for the last 25 years, and we think we've done a good job. Next, please. At least we know we're being fired for doing a good job. So. I do spend most of my time talking about climate because climate really does change everything. And yes, it really is much worse than we think. Uh, as I say in my practice as, a, as an environmental lawyer, I thought I had a pretty good lay sense about climate change and I have been completely gobsmacked since I became commissioner to how much worse it is than I thought, how much faster it's coming. And every study I read, it's coming faster and faster and faster and faster. And it's here. It's here already in Ontario. Um, I've got lots of slides I'd love to show you, but I can't. Anyway, next, please. So we, we know we've had impact. It's always easier to measure outputs than, out, uh, than outcomes. We can't really measure outcomes. And when good things happen, there's generally no paper trail to say that it has anything to do with us. Governments, even if they steal our ideas, they don't like to acknowledge that they stole their ideas. They just like to say it's their idea, which is fine. Um, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I took this job to produce results, not to necessarily get headlines. So we're, we're proud of a lot of things we did. Um, next, please. And so what now? Right. So this is what's in the bill. Next, please. So there you go. We've got, uh, you know, the, the environmental laws of a generation are in danger um, to one degree or another. Not all of them, at least at the moment. But uh, what we do see is, is pretty terrifying. Um, We've also seen what to me is just extraordinary. I think it's 18 times so far the government has passed laws giving itself immunity for breaking the law. Breach of trust, breach of fiduciary duty, um, misrepresentation, breach of the Securities Act, breach of contract. To me, this is extraordinary, and I, I remain appalled that the Bar Association won't say anything, but that's, uh, that's, the, that's the current approach. Next, please. Um, we've had a wrenching halt to anything on climate, just as climate change becomes uh, more and more obvious, more and more dangerous. Um, it's all been cut. Uh, the money for most of the energy efficiency programs in Ontario has been cut. It's all the cap, the cap and trade was cut. The, most of the climate programs were cut. Um, and now we're saying, well, you know what? We gave it the office. Let somebody else work on climate change. That seems to be the basic position of the government these days. Next, please. Um, then, of course, we're uh, weakening the Environmental Bill of Rights. And it's, there's a certain extra twist to the fact that they do this in a statute with this title. But there is nothing in that statute that should improve trust or accountability or transparency. It's a little bit like some of those novels we read so many years ago. Right. Brave New World in 1984. You, call some, you do something and call it the opposite. Well, that's what they're doing. Next, please. Um, right, I think I said that. Um, in the meantime, for some unknown length of time, I continue to be your commissioner. I can, I'm on the road up and down Ontario. So uh, yesterday I gave two talks in Guelph. Last week was brought to you by the letter K. I was in Kitchener and Kingston. The week before it was Chiging, Little Current, Sudbury and North Bay. Next week is Timmins and Ottawa, and so on and so forth. Ontario is really big. Um, and we are doing everything we can uh, while we can. And certainly, I would encourage you, if you want to download our reports, do it now. The website may survive, or it may not. There's no guarantees. There's nothing in the statute. 
Um, we do have a number of examples around the world, including and in Canada. So you may or may not remember the National Roundtable was just a, a spectacular group to have different interests meeting together in a nonpartisan way to negotiate about how to have, how to bring together environment and economy, and they were doing wonderful things. Mr. Harper uh, not only got rid of the round table, he, he took down the website and tried to destroy public access to all the reports. Uh, conservatives did the same thing in Australia when they eliminated the Climate Committee. We see the same thing happening in the US, and we see some of the same things happening in Ontario already. So will my website survive, for, and for how long, and will you be able to get things? Maybe yes, maybe no, but there's no guarantee, so I suggest you get them now. Maybe the law school, maybe your, your faculty. I mean, this stuff was done at public expense. Next, please. Um, right, so the, there is one of my obligations that will be transferred to the Auditor General. She will be obliged to report each year on the operation of the Environmental Bill of Rights. Um, good, I guess. I hope, I hope, I hope that goes well. Uh, at, at her request, apparently, according to the transcript, the um, mandatory reporting on environment and climate has been made optional. Um, so maybe she will, and maybe she won't. And um, yeah, she comes at these issues from a very different background and point of view than I do. Next, please. Um, the education outreach function is going to be, uh, well, allegedly, the responsibility of the Ministry of Environment. Um, we can also expect the Ministry of Environment to see significant budget cuts, because we keep hearing the government that everyone is going to have sacrifices. So are they really going to have money, energy, and enthusiasm to encourage people to criticize the government? What do you think? Will this be a high priority? Next, please. Um, the Environmental Registry, uh, there's nothing changed in the bill about that. They may or may not finish the work that's been underway to upgrade the registry, which we've been working on so hard, which, which makes the registry much more accessible. Um, but all, I mean, I hope they do this. We. Uh, well, there's also the question that one of the things we've been doing when people have applications for enforcement or for, for reviews, they've been sending them to us. We make sure they go to the right ministry, and then I've been bird-dogging it. I've been, so I've, pest, I've been meeting with the deputies regularly and pestering them about what are you doing about this, what are you doing about that. Um, and it needs pestering. When I became environmental commissioner, there were 1,800 examples um, of environmentally significant decisions that the government had made and never posted. And that meant nobody had their right to appeal. Nobody knew what had happened. Um, and so that's an example of what happens when the government is left with this responsibility by itself. And if you think about the applications, not many people in the public know who, which department, especially because the names change every you know, couple of years, it seems, which department is actually going to deal with my problem about invasive species or endangered species or whatever. They don't know. And these, these applications, they tend to just disappear into the ministry. So we've done a huge amount of work bird dogging and encouraging and following up. And so we don't get to control what the results are, but at least we've been able to participate in the conversation, make sure they hear the right stakeholders. We were able to get the Ministry of Environment to start posting quarterly updates on the applications, meeting with the applicants, being more transparent about what they were doing, and all of that is going to vanish. Um, next, please. So. Um, Right? We, we tend to assume that if, thing, if, if things are going well, that they will continue to go well, because we like them that way. The old joke when I was in practice was, uh, I was a litigator, uh, or ended up as a litigator anyway, so if you win a case, it's because the client was right, of course. And if you lose a case, it's because the lawyer was no good. That there's a large grain of truth in this. When things go well, people think it's someone's fault. When things, go, uh, when things go badly, they think it's someone's fault. When things go well, they think it's obvious, it's automatic, it'll continue by itself. And that's the way people feel about clean air and clean water, and being able to see the birds outside and uh, have a, a stable climate. And it's not true. These things are fragile, and they take active guarding, or we'll lose them. We've seen it before, we're seeing it now. So I'm doing everything I can, but now it's probably up to you folks. So next, please, I think that's it, almost. Oh yes, this one. So, um, 
Let me see what else I thought I was going to say. Yeah, no, that's it. So th this is, I, I end a lot of the climate talks like this. I say to people, well, who would like to have some hope? And well, that includes me. Um, and I think this is, this is the only recipe for hope. Keeping your head in the sand, pretending it's not happening, this is not going to provide good results. It never does. The only thing that can possibly give us hope is, first of all, to look the facts in the face, even though they're not pretty, and then to look at each other and find some way to work with other people on these issues to make something happen. And that's the only, and that's the only hope for us. So I hope you'll do something. Thank you. Hi. Thanks so much, Diane. Um, I know that some of you will have to leave at 1.30. So I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna take some questions here. Jose is dying to get in. I'm coming to you in one second. Um, uh, I know that if you have to leave, uh, that's okay to do so right now. We'll do a, a short Q&A of about uh, 10, 10 minutes or so. And then um, the joint program students are gonna move to another room for the rest of their seminar. So. Um, thanks very much, Alice. Really appreciate having you here for that introduction. And uh, I'm going to hand the mic over to uh, Professor Echeverry. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Sachs, uh, Diane. Look, um, I'll make this brief. The dean has to leave. Um, uh, this, you forgot to mention, this has happened before. In the United Kingdom, uh, the Commission on Sustainable Development was disbanded after they produced a report that was very, very detailed about the future of nuclear power in that country. And the government of the day, instead of paying attention to the very thorough recommendations, disbanded the commission. Our good friend Peter Victor, which is a professor at our faculty, was friends with one of the commissioners. And they managed to save the website. The website still exists if you put it in the internet because somebody created a mirror, and a mirror of a mirror and a mirror. So you can't toss it away. We should do the same. Uh, I'm gonna take the liberty to speak with Dana Craig, our librarian at the Faculty of Environmental Studies, to see how we can create one mirror. Uh, I think law should create another mirror, so these cannot go away. I mean, this is one of those moments when people are taking advantage of the system, so be it uh, whatever. But we have the responsibility to protect the public good. And all the information that has been created should not go away, uh, should be protected in this mirror manner that I mentioned. And last but not least, you have a home, and I, I cannot speak for the Faculty of Environmental Studies, but certainly with our shop, you got a, uh, a home, uh, you need to write about this for the next four years. Because every bad thing, ladies and gentlemen, does not last forever. Remember the motto of your faculty. We need to pay attention to law uh, so justice can follow. Uh, bad times happen, uh, but they don't last forever. Um, and you will always, I'm sure I'm speaking for my colleagues, will have a home at York University. We will protect the public good in this one and others. Thank uh, you. So thank you, thank very, you very much, much, and I'm sorry I have to leave. Okay, well, thank you. I'm sorry I got stuck on the subway. So just before Jose was saying that, I was thinking, well, the Osgood Digital Commons has to be good for something like this, too. So maybe we can uh, get a conversation started here about um, at least getting all of those reports posted electronically on the uh, Osgood website. Um, more questions for the commissioner? Hi. Is there a way to do a good job without getting fired? <laughs> um, and how? Uh, well, obviously, I proved, uh, <laughs> I proved the contrary, I suppose. I mean, they had to change, they had to pass special legislation to get rid of me and to break my contract and so on. Um, well, when there's a majority government, they can, unless it breaks, uh, unless it's contrary to the Constitution. Uh, so, I guess my question, maybe more broadly, when you're trying to do something that will make a change in any field related to the environment, right. how could you do it without 
without, without being at risk. Without getting fired and without, yeah. Um, I don't think there are any risk-free methods. Um, this, when we talk about environmental protection, we're talking about standing in the way of the default method, which is to destroy the natural world and make money. And oh, people make a lot of money. You know, uh, I've been quoted many times as saying that in Ontario, land development is our oil sands. Well, it is. Politically, economically, environmentally, it's our oil sands. And we see that with the uh, government rolling back the restrictions in the, in the growth plan and driving uh, more and more urban sprawl, which is not good for anybody except the developers who make a lot of money in the short run. So when you stand in the way of powerful, rich people, it's, it's not, can't be entirely safe. So, which is probably why a lot of people don't do anything. Thank you. But, um, I mean, I still think there are things that can be done, and I've tried to do all the ones I can. I have worked really hard to, to serve all the parties. I have met, you know, personally with all of the parties and provided briefings. I have been as respectful and careful and nonpartisan as I can. And it didn't help. Um, well, I mean, it may have helped, but it doesn't prevent them amending the, the statute to get rid of me. So, so probably there's no entirely safe way. And that's true for people who fight for anything else. I mean, it's true for people who fought for the end of slavery. It's true for people who fought for gay marriage. It's true for people who fought for lots of things. It was never entirely safe. But sometimes you still have to do it. Um, Dr. Sachs, thank you for all the work you've done. I've seen you um, effectively communicate the dire consequences of climate change to people in finance. And I saw them have tears in their eyes after. So. I've Thank, Thank you for you. all the work you've done there. Um, my question is, is the current government um, is basically putting fires on all these environmental legislations uh, that have served as the backbone of Ontario environmental law. Um, I'm personally very interested in Bill 66 and the consequences to the Greenbelt Act. Um, but my question to you is, with all these fires, um, in your perspective, which ones do you think rank highest in priority that right. students like us should be focusing right. on? Um, that's a really good question. I understand that everyone has limited time and energy and, and no one can fight everything all the time. Um, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about whether there's a way to build human bridges to the conservative MPPs. Um, because I don't think we change minds by yelling at people. And I know we don't change minds just with facts. We change minds with stories and with human connection. So if you, if you have an opportunity, if you or someone that you love or is close to is in a conservative riding, um, there is a real opportunity to go see your MPP, go with a group of other people, and raise these issues over and over. It's also, I think, very valuable to speak up. Uh, well, we've got a federal election this year. Voices are going to matter. Municipal governments are, are getting started, so there's new municipal councillors making decisions about what goes ahead, and, and if the province, as the province refuses to lead municipal action, is going to be, to be more important. So I didn't really answer your question. Um, I, I guess, I mean, to me, climate is going to overwhelm everything else. No, if we get climate wrong, nothing else is going to matter. So that's the one that I work on the most. But I, I think you need to come to that with what you love most, what you know most, and who you know. Like, where is your opportunity? So if you have an opportunity to, and, and knowledge to really work on water quality, I think speak from where, from where you are with the people that you know. That would be my, my best guess. Um, so she kind of touched on my question a little bit, but I just want to ask in more detail. So you said you're very critical of the like the recent government. I was curious on your position on Bill 66 and if you think it's something to be alarmed about. Yes, absolutely, you should be alarmed. Uh, I, I do, with the, the Schedule 10 in particular, proposes to blow a hole in all of the environmental protections that restrict land use. And 
that matters for climate resilience, it matters for flooding, it matters for species, it matters for just the quality of life. So yes, it's, uh, it's immensely harmful. The reason we have planning is because we saw after half a century how allowing development anywhere people can make money is tremendously devastating to the public. It's devastating to public expense. It's devastating to the cost of infrastructure. Yeah, yes, it's, a, it's an extremely dangerous, extremely damaging, extremely divisive approach. And then it requires each council, puts each council on the, the hot seat to, to then make these decisions in ways that affect people even beyond them. They don't have a say. So um, yeah, I think it's very serious. And that's a place where going to speak to your municipal representatives is is important. Oh, one thing I always want to say to students, students are notorious for not voting. Have you all seen the ad that went around the US midterms, young people don't vote? Have you seen it? If you haven't seen it, look it up. Young people tend not to vote. And so that allows things that are bad for you, bad for your future to be decided because you know, you're not going to show up and vote anyway. If you are going to vote. So I suppose going back to what matters the most, having young people speak up and vote is probably one of the really important things that you might be well placed to help with. Um, young people, if this is your future. Now, climate change is going to happen in, in much more of your life than in mine. So did that Thanks. help? Yes. OK. More, I guess, a comment than a question. Not only should young people vote, but I see that the environmental movement uh, needs to embrace electoral reform as a really big part of what we do. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, don't, I don't think I'm exaggerating by saying that our system creates elected dictatorships, essentially, and, and not majoritarian elected dictatorships either. And I, I am deeply concerned increasingly concerned when it becomes as obvious as what happened with the Ford government, that so few people could elect a government that has so much power and there's really not much that anyone else can do. And in the age of omnibus bills, um, anyway, I, I'm, you know, I have a, a liberal MP who I speak to regularly, at the, and I have an NDP MPP who I, I honestly don't know what purpose she really serves in, in this sort of an environment, right. and it's very stressful. Right. So maybe your municipal councillor is a better place to put your, your efforts. Yeah, so then there's that as well. Um, but I guess just like electoral reform and actually getting a right. system that we can say is a representative yeah. democracy right. um, is, is going to be hugely important going yeah. forward, I think. I understand that, that argument, and I, I have a friend who feels passionately and has been working on proportional representation for a very, very long time. Um, My own feeling, and I may be wrong, is we don't have time to wait for it. We have such a small handful of years left to affect the future on climate, and electoral reform is never that fast. Although, I mean, I think you're right, it's important. But to me, we can't wait. And so then the question is, all right, given the, the very difficult situation that we have and the very small number of people who choose the leader of the party and so on, um, that's where I go back to, all right, we, being, being, as I said, being conservative doesn't have to mean being an environmental vandal. We should ha be able to agree in common that we would like, for example, survival for ourselves and our children. That ought to be a common objective. So that ought to be possible regardless of party to find ways to work on the biggest threats because otherwise what is there? And um, again, maybe I'm being too naive, but I, I think that that's, that's the most urgent thing, is how do we build bridges to people who have different points of view about this? It's got to be possible somehow. OK, I think we're out of time. So um, if you can just join me again in thanking uh, Diane Sachs for being with us today. Thank you.